Welcome to Sparks of History. Joining us today is Rabbi Evan Hoffman, spiritual leader of Congregation Anshe Shalom in New Rochelle, New York, and author of Parsha Themes in Historical Perspective. Thank you so much for being with us today, Rabbi Hoffman. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, I'm just going to throw out a, a bunch of questions about the uh, current situation, and we'll take it from there. Um, what What is your take on the alarming rise of anti-Semitism today in the United States? What's the mood of your community? Um, how concerned are collegiates and the parents that you encounter how concerned are they about what's happening on the college campuses in, throughout the United States? And um, as head of the Westchester Board of Rabbis, what was your stance regarding the meeting with U.S. Representative Jamal Bauman? And what can and what should, should rabbinical leaders be doing today uh, in the New York area across the United States? Those are all very important questions, so I'll try to cover as many of them as I can. Okay. Uh, as for the alarming rise of anti-Semitism, I would say at the practical level, people uh, are seriously concerned about physical security for Jewish institutions in a way that they previously were not. It was it was often taken for granted in the United States that whereas a Jewish synagogue, a house of worship, a Jewish school in other countries, you know, South American countries, European countries, have to, as a matter of course, have armed guards and rigorous security measures, that in the United States, we can get away with a more relaxed attitude and save money by not investing heavily in these sorts of things. Uh, after October 7th, that changed, even for places that can't really afford uh major uh, security investment because the finances simply aren't there. Nonetheless, they recognize you have to do something. You can't do nothing. There, There is a, a, a real sense of um, the possibility of violent action. As for um, collegiates and their parents, I would say it's already you know happening for years that parents were concerned about what would happen to their children on the campus, but that concern was more about indoctrination in ways which were counter, you know, contrary to traditional Judaism or to Zionist ethos. And the worry was that the kid would come back from college uh, having different values and espousing you know, unpleasant views in the eyes of the parents. Now the concern is very different. Now the concern is that while on the campus, they'll be harassed and bullied maybe not with physical force, but maybe yes with physical force, and that it's not good to send your kid off to a state university, an Ivy League university, that uh, they have to be held close to home, so to speak, in uh, a more Jewish environment. And even campuses that have had historically a heavy Jewish environment with good Hillel, good Chabad, 20% Jewish campus, nonetheless, the other 80% is seen now as hostile. Uh, it changes the, the mindset of the parents of Jewish teenagers in this country. And, and I'm not sure that it can be undone so readily. This is uh, going to be something that is going to, we'll have to deal with for a while, even after this Israel-Hamas war is over, uh, because the kinds of statements being made on the campuses are so egregious that they will not easily be, you know, put in the back, uh, you know, behind us. Um, as for Westchester, so I'll say this much. I, I am the president of the Westchester Board of Rabbis, and we do have a congressman in our district, New York 16, who was not very well liked by our community from day one. He had defeated the, you know, the incumbent in 2020 was Elliot Engel, a great friend of the state of Israel, a great friend of the Jewish community who had been the chairman of the House uh, Foreign Relations Committee. So putting aside the fact that he was a friend of Am Yisrael, he was a, a powerful figure on Capitol Hill. For him to lose in a primary to some upstart was surprising uh, and really disappointing. Uh, uh, Bowman, in his first uh, term, made, uh, I wouldn't say... Uh, virulent enemies out of the Jewish community, but he he said plenty of things that we didn't like, and the relationship was a, a, you know a sour relationship. But over the past six weeks, seven weeks, 
it's gotten so egregious that uh, to the point of him being a persona non grata in our community, uh, he, he made an, an effort to have some sort of reconciliation breakfast that um, my organization boycotted. Uh, we issued a statement condemning his support for um, a unilateral ceasefire in Israel's part uh, and his his track record on the congressional you know, House votes, where he is among nine or 10 or 11 Democrats and one usually one Republican against 410 others. So he's in the fringe minority in the, you know, the, the federal legislature. So we condemned that. Uh, and at this breakfast, which I did not attend, but I heard uh, intelligence reports that he said when asked if, if you could do it all over again, knowing that what you know now about how you have grieved much of your constituency would you change any of your voting patterns and his abrupt answer was no so that doesn't get that doesn't make you have very many friends uh, what should you know rabbinical organizations do the answer is number one the rabbinical organizations have a responsibility to motivate their constituencies you know, the the congregants the the, the hamonam the masses of jewry to not sit on the sidelines, to be active in defense of our own interests. Now, there are you know, constraints in terms of nonprofit laws and not being able to endorse political candidates, and that's all well and good. But nonetheless, you can vigorously uh, espouse your own values, and the candidates can, can take the hint. Uh, in my district, the rabbis as private citizens, not as representatives of their uh of their synagogues or schools suggested to our county executive, Mr. Latimer, that he run a campaign against Mr. Moman, and we'll see what happens. It all depends upon redistricting. And the redistricting was designed specifically to rob the Jewish community of Westchester of any political power. This was a deliberate attempt by people, by certain enemies of ours in Albany to, to destroy the, the voting block of the Jewish community. So that's uh, some hyper-local uh, gossip, so to speak. But I hope it was useful. Uh, I, I was speaking to a uh, an old friend from out of town, and um, th th this is one of the sweetest people you you you, you could ever meet. And, and he was he was telling me about the security in his local synagogue. They now have two guards on on Shabbat on the Sabbath. And then he said, "And I pack." I pack a gun, and I I said, "What? You pack a gun? I mean, what? What? And it, it is are you seeing this in in the communities across New York? And and is this really an answer to anything in so, the long term?" So I I would say that there are many people in the Jewish community who already had experience with firearms and may have the legal right to carry, depending upon what state they're in and what the local laws are. And they're interested in doing so in the synagogue on the premise that it may prove helpful in an emergency situation. Oftentimes it is the case that the people who do this don't talk about it because, or at least don't make a big public spectacle out of it, because they may be violating synagogue policy or violating local law. In New York State, there are very strict regulations about who's allowed to carry a weapon in a house of worship. It, uh, it has to be someone who, who who passed a training course for security guard purposes. Now, they don't have to be a paid employee. They could be a volunteer, but it's more than just a carry license. Uh, so there are there are people who may be in, in violation of local ordinances, unbeknownst to them, but they're doing it out of the, the sincere desire to be helpful. Got it. Okay. So um, as a rabbi, it's, it's not something that you would endorse or promote. I would certainly not want someone who is a cowboy and cavalier in their handling of a firearm to be having one in a crowded room on a Shabbat morning. But I would not have a problem with someone with uh, a strong track record of either military service or, or police service who knows what they're doing and whose presence really will be beneficial. As one who is who is a historian who has studied deeply uh, the history of, of, of America and American Jewry, are you pessimistic today, optimistic? Uh, 
What are your feelings about where American Jewry is headed? It's a good question. You know, people have a tendency to say when uh, anti-Semitism is on the rise, that go get your passport because you're going to have to move to Israel. I remember a former and, and you're always of mine, welcome. And you're always okay, welcome. And, and, a, and a former congregant of mine said in 1984, and he was someone who grew up in Israel and grew up in Haifa uh, in the 40s and 50s and moved to New York in the 1960s to go to medical school. But his father still lived back in Haifa. And in 1984, when Jesse Jackson ran for president and made reference to Town, the father called him and said, New bicycle, do you have your passport ready? So, yes, that's always been on, you know, in the in the, in the mind of some people in our, in our community. But I must say, when does anti-Semitism uh, become inflamed in America when there are bad things happening in Israel? It's far more dangerous in Israel than it is in America. So as much as the, the Zionist in me doesn't want to dissuade anyone from making Aliyah, if your issue was physical security, I mean, America, although it might not be the most pleasant place right now, is far safer than Israel. You should go of Aliyah out of ideological desire and 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 uh, enthusiasm, not running away from what is actually a less problematic place in America. Uh, but that said, I was very worried, very very worried, in 2020, 2021, about the ability of the Jewish community in in, in the United States to counter anti-Semitism. And the reason why I was so worried about it then is because of the hyperpolarization of American politics. Never before in the history of the Jewish people have a, has a diaspora Jewish community been so uh, engaged politically on the, 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 at the domestic level on issues which are not particularly Jewish. So you have rabidly left-wing Democrat Jews, rabidly right-wing Republican Jews who don't see eye to eye on anything of substance and are in the same shul, in the same school, in the same community, but they're at each other's throats over political concerns. And that blinded these people to anti-Semitism, each one on his own side. So the, the leftists made excuses for left-wing anti-Semitism, the right-wing made excuses for right-wing anti-Semitism. And what is the end result? An inability to coalesce and collectively counteract all forms of anti-Semitism. And it's still true even after October 7th to an extent. I mean, it maybe has improved slightly in the spirit of, of Am Yisrael Chai and uh, Kol Yisrael Arivim Zeb Azeh. We're all tied together as one people. But even with that um, attitude, which is a good attitude, still the, the political polarization in the United States has not gone away. And the ability to, to fight anti-Semitism, even to identify anti-Semitism, is problematic to say the least. Is, is this a, just an educational issue? Is, is it a lack of, uh, you know, you, 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 you see these, these reels where uh, people are going undercover to, to some of these pro-Palestinian rallies and they're asking questions that people have literally have no idea what they're talking about. They're saying things and, and have yeah. no idea. Is, is it, is it ignorance? And is that what's happening on the college campuses, a lack of education? And can that really solve you know, deeply the, rooted the, anti-Semitism, if it is deeply rooted? The answer is it, it doesn't solve everything. You know, for a long time, for a long time, uh, people would joke that Israeli Hasbara was very bad. And if only it were better, things would improve. Uh, the, the former consul general to the, to the state of the state of Israel to, to New York was Alon Pincus back, I think, in the 90s, early 2000s. And he famously said the greatest danger to the world's salmon supply is Hasbara, because all those lox, bagels and lox breakfasts. Um, and his point was, if we did a better job, we'd have more friends in the Western world. And that might be true on the margins, but it's not really the case now. I would say that Yes, it's true. If 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 people did know the egregious nature of Hamas's attack on October seven or their long track record of of inhumanity, uh, we might win over a few more friends. But I think that for many people in the Western world who are not Arab, who are not Muslim, and who don't have a dog in the race, so to speak, they're not Jewish either. They're just picking a side. Still, a lot of people are going to pick the Arab side in, in this conflict. And we, we can't just take for granted that better um, 
propaganda on our part will win us all these friends and that our only adversary will be those who by way of ethnic or religious attachment are are inevitably going to be on the other side. No, no, there, there will be a lot of people on the other side. And that's a disconcerting notion for American Jews who, who have to live and work and play and interact with these people on a daily basis. You know, there are 350 million Americans, and I'm saying a substantial number are not going to be our friends. Uh, as, a, as a patriotic American citizen, it, it troubles me that I have to say that, but I have to say it. Is this a generational issue? You know, the, the what was the, the greatest generation from World War II and the memories of of the Holocaust and, and patriotism in America is, is now a, a generational shift that, that you think is happening in America? It certainly is true that there that if you look at the various demographic groups, the younger you go down the ladder, the less friendly people will likely be to the Jewish people. And the older they are, if they experienced uh, the, the era of World War II or even 50, 60, 50, 40 years ago, uh, and were alive then, they have different memories, personal memories of the existence of the state of Israel being under threat, and so they're less likely to be antagonistic to the Jewish state. But yeah, a younger people who whose memories include only either the first Lebanon war to the present or the second intifada to the present uh, are not, or only include the last five years or the last five minutes are not going to be very friendly to uh, to our people. So there's a definitely a generational divide. Uh, and the great challenge will be how to win over more allies in the younger set. And I don't have all I don't know if we have all the answers. I'm not sure we have many very good answers. Uh, it's a challenge. Right. So I'll just go back again. Optimistic, pessimistic, somewhere in between. Uh, somewhere in between, but I'll give you one positive note. I'll give you one positive note. You know, there are those who will say that, and, and usually it's Republicans who say this because everybody has their agenda, uh, that the Democratic Party is, is, is veering in a certain anti-Israel direction and that the future of their party is going to be hostile to, to the state of Israel. And that very well may be true. But if I had to pick right now, would I rather have you know, wild... Uh, riots in the streets and the support of certain uh, elements of the intellectual elite on my side, or would I rather have 415 congressmen on my side? I'd rather have 415 congressmen. If I were uh, a, 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 you know, a, a Palestinian American and not necessarily a supporter of Hamas's atrocities, but nonetheless someone who wanted to see my people win out in this conflict, I wouldn't be too pleased with the fact that 90% of the, the federal legislature in this country is supporting the Jewish state. So I, as a Jew and a Zionist, take some comfort in that. Yes, I see there there is a trajectory that may not be all that good, but it takes time for things to change. And politicians are different from, uh, from ivory tower professors or street activists. So the, the, the positive message is we still have a lot of friends in important places and we're not being abandoned. Okay. Um, anything else, Rabbi Hoffman, that you would like to add? I, you know, just throwing out the questions there and uh, really appreciate your time. Any final thoughts on, on the issue? A, a final thought on the issue of anti-Semitism, I, I would say this. Uh, there is a real uh, question mark about the participation in the overall Jewish community on the part of those who have espoused if not pro-Hamas, at least Hamas-sympathetic views over the last month and a half. It's, I would say, a negligible percentage of the community, but not zero. And they're making a lot of noise, including taking over Grand Central Station in New York. Uh, and we as a community are going to have to learn how to deal with that because the temptation has always been the wide tent, the umbrella organization that is all-encompassing. Well, there reaches a point where you can't be all-encompassing. Somebody has, you know, has to be on the outs who's gone too far. And that will be a great challenge for communal leadership going forward. What views are out of the Overton window, Jewishly speaking? You know, what is beyond the pale and therefore to be condemned and to have those people ousted and canceled from the, from the face of the Jewish earth? Uh, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but something has to happen. Okay. Again, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Appreciate it very much. And we My should pleasure. only hear good news. Besarot Tavot. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you.